um, yeah, I see people are signing up. Great, great to see you. Um, please write in the chat box where you're from. Uh, yeah, what brings you here? What your interest in complexity is? Today, um, I'll be hosting and sharing <laughs> some ideas uh, on our work that we've been doing, sort of on how to think more practically about complexity and recognizing complexity and applying that in sustainability challenges or even the work that we're doing. And I won't have an extra pair of eyes with me to, um, to navigate me through questions and answers and chat box messages, but I'd, I'd love to see who's with us um, and to just sort of get an idea for, yeah, who's, who's, who's engaging with us. I see names like Dirk, um, nice to see you, Dirk, <laughs> that you're here. Uh, Barry, um, Ingrid, yeah, great to, great to see you. Um, thank you very much for joining us and for, for being with us today. Um, we have a little bit of a different format today in the sense that it seems that so many people were kind of busy and it's the, it's the week before the, the long weekend. So um, people are up and about and I think doing other things and it's April, usually it's not a good month for planning online or other engagements. But um, yeah, just, just to say thank you for, for being with us today. Um, you're joining the CST uh, Thursday seminar uh, webinars and we've been running this now for almost a year actually. Um, started every, every Thursday, now it's every second Thursday and we've, we've really had a fantastic response to our themes and ideas and people um, sharing and presenting some work. The idea is basically to um, just to share how people are using complexity, resilience ideas um, in their everyday practices, in their workspaces, in their research spaces, um, for us to learn and share from each other. It's almost become like a kind of a community of practice, these webinars, where we engage with people who've been um, sharing ideas in different ways. And um, it's been extremely well received. I've had, we've had so much good feedback about how these um, conversations are just um, allowing people to share and learn and to connect also with each other in a different way. So yeah, wonderful um, that, you're, that you're with us and you can be with us today. I might uh, just see how many um, people join us. I think we're about just over 30, which is great. Um, but the format will just be that I'll do a short um, sort of I'll just sort of, it won't be a bit of a conversation like it always is, but I'll uh, just do a kind of short presentation of some of the ideas that we've been working on the last few years and sharing on how this has been um, uh, implemented in, in various ways, and then open a discussion um, towards the end, and I won't be presenting that long. And um, even if you have questions, um, I might be able to, um, you know, Put you, uh, if you wanted to maybe ask something online, put your hand up towards the end and I can see if I can, I'll promote you to host or to a panelist and we, it could be maybe some kind of conversation happening. Right, so yeah, please in the chat box, um, write where you're from, what you're doing um, and what your sort of um, interesting complexity is um, or in, you know, in how you implementing this in different spaces. It's just nice for everyone to get an idea of who's with us, who's joining us, because we can't see each other. All right, so I think I'll start um, just to introduce myself. My name is Rika Preiser, and I'm based at the Center for, that used to be the Complex Systems in Transition Center. That's now changed to the Center for Sustainability Transitions, but we'll have a special seminar or webinar on um, launching that and also to explain why we've, we've changed and what's happening. But basically it's a kind of a development into a broader engagement with sustainability challenges and transformation and understanding how both transformation and sustainability can be happening in the context of using systems and complexity lenses. Um, so we'll have a special webinar on that. We will introduce new logo and new name and also just share the broader kind of work that we're doing in this space at the moment. Um, yeah, and um, I think um, in this webinar that we do, we, we really wanted to sort of share just a wide perspective of ways and means how people are engaging with complexity ideas or systems ideas to inform development work, um, practicing how, how these ideas are actually employed in practice um, and what are new sort of conceptual frameworks and ideas or papers 
um, that are coming out and it's become a huge sharing space. And thank you for everyone that's been contributing um, and sharing in such a great way. Yeah, so please, please keep on just writing in the text box where you're from and what your interest is. Tally, I see you there as well. Great to connect with you again. Yeah, and to just uh, also learn from, from in which spaces you're working. So let's start. I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, have a sort of just a, a short overview of what it is that we want to um, engage with today. Um, let me just see if I can make this full screen and then um, put it on view like that. Yeah. So please, please forgive me. I'm I'm co I'm hosting and presenting today. Um, we've had a bit of a kind of a challenge with people that have confirmed and had to cancel on last minute. And it seems that everyone's busy with projects at the moment and reports. So um, we, we thought it'd be great to just share some ideas of, of what we've been engaged with at the moment. So yeah, today, I think that it would be interesting to just share the idea about recognizing complexity, practical implications for sustainability research and practice. And obviously for that, the concept or the context in which we're doing, all of us here today are uh, doing this work is in the context of what we call the Anthropocene, which is really for me and uh, this, this kind of recognition of com the ultimate kind of recognition of complexity. And we recognize that in the fact that human, human beings aren't just, um, you know, uh, we, we're not just sort of on the earth and uh, engaging or affecting earth systems. We've become, um, our being on the earth is affecting and, and changing earth systems in the same way like natural phenomena. Um, and that interconnectedness and the scale and the rate of change um, at which this is happening and at which we're impacting natural systems is actually for me one key feature of the Anthropocene. And it's, it's, a, it's a deep recognition of complexity to the extent that we haven't seen before um, and that we haven't been able to deal with before. Um, I think I've uh, yeah, read somewhere recently that also the number of birds that are that we are breeding is almost probably or the, if you if you the, the 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 mass of birds kept in captivity is now larger than the mass of maybe wild birds found out some you know on, uh, in natural habitats. So that those are the kinds of measurements um, and ideas that we are thinking about in the Anthropocene and trying to understand how we are impacting the earth um, as a kind of a natural phenomena. And it seems that all over people are trying to, yeah, uh, engage with this new recognition or this new awareness that the, the influences and our impacts and the relations and the behaviors of systems and the patterns that we see coming and arising from this um, seems to have a certain kind of, certain kinds of features. And everyone is in a specific way trying to, to engage with that. And for people who are working with systems, and understanding these natural human um, engagements as systemic problems are also trying to think about um, how can we um, understand and study those systems better? Yeah, and how can we start reading the signs of understanding complexity? How can we start seeing what, what is emerging and how can we start interpreting them as features of complex systems? So we see that one of the, as written here in the Institute of Advanced Studies in um, Yes, in Amsterdam, where they also say we live in a world where everything seems to be interwoven with everything else and where cause and effect are hard to unravel. Understanding what kind of intervention will produce what type of outcome is one of our most urgent and challenging questions of our time. And people are working and we see that also the nature of addressing these kinds of questions is that people are working together in dif from different fields. Um, and um, trying to address, to address you know, all the different uh, challenges connected to this interconnected or interwoven nature of, of what we're seeing of the world today. And there's so many publications these days coming out on, in spaces where people are thinking about this, in spaces that, that hasn't been you know, studied before as complex systems. Um, we see that um, in, you know, people are thinking about climate change, especially um, uh, peace studies, um, we, we're seeing it how people are engaging with that from managing, you know, local fisheries, um, thinking about these ideas, bottom up emergence, or we, what we see across these um, documents and engagement is, is people are also using a new kind of language. And this language is linking to the features 
characteristics, behaviors of systems. And, and all of this is sort of influencing this, this larger and broader engagement um, of, of the features of complex systems. And um, already in 2005, coming from a more, um, uh, I would say a scientific or broader scientific perspective, John Uri um, at Lancaster University in the UK already called this um, sort of growth in understanding of systems and complexity in the natural sciences. Um, he started calling that the complexity turn um, where people are sort of um, engaging with these ideas from a more conceptual level. But what we are seeing today is that complexity turn is not just a conceptual and a phenomena that sort of um, moved from the natural systems, natural sciences, but that it's really informing so many other domains today um, that has become quite, quite mainstream even. So something that started out in the 1990s and 1980s, specific, specifically in the natural sciences, um, uh, was, was kind of, you know, not mainstream um, around about the turn of the century. But today, 20 years later, we see that these ideas of systems thinking and complexity are really becoming mainstream. Recently, I've been contacted by a, um, a colleague in Portugal, Ana Texero de Melo, um, who engaged with me and we, we started this conversation and she and her team have been doing really interesting work um, on this notion of thinking in complexity. And she's just brought out a paper um, last year um, where she's really sort of also trying to engage with the scope of words and themes and um, conceptual ideas that, that's coming from, from a, a huge number of um, publications and papers that are, that are engaging with this notion of complexity. In this paper, and I thought I'd just share it here today because when I read it and when I spoke with her, I realized that they did an enormous uh, bibliometrical analysis of a lot of complexity literature over um, a long time. And they're trying to see how people in various spaces are using this notion of complexity. Um, and she, they realized that people are also coming up with this word called complexity thinking, which many of you have also been using in your work. And, she's, and they tried to find out, but how are people using that? And I really can suggest uh, delving into this paper. Um, uh, we, and I'd like to just maybe quote the first paragraph of her work here, where they, where they say the rise of complexity sciences has led to the development of new language about systems. Concepts such as complex systems thinking or complexity thinking have appeared in the literature, appealing to a ways of thinking in complexity. And what, what they also say is this notion of complex thinking may be considered as a ref referring to a mode of thinking more congruent with the complexity of the world. So, um, and, and this last sentence, the widespread and some times undifferentiated usage of these concepts result in a lack of clarity and terminological confusion, which jeopardizes their heuristic and pragmatic value. And I think that's also what I've been, or what or many of us have been sensing um, when we engage with teaching um, systems and complexity thinking or introductions to complexity courses. Um, when you start looking for literature and um, ideas about um, uh, how to teach this or how to introduce this to people that, that come from a variety of different spaces, from policy spaces or activist spaces, from management spaces or um, conservation ecology spaces, people all come to this, um, this understanding of systems and complexity, maybe with a different idea. Um, and what, what we see is it, be, it becomes quite difficult at the moment to, to start making sense of, of you know, where to enter this space and what terms to use and how do we orientate ourselves. And it also what we see is it does, it, it almost, you know, there are so many entry points that there's not a, you know, um, kind of standard approach to that, which is also good, which means that it's a, it's a kind of a concept or a field of study that can be approached by so many different perspectives. Um, but that could jeopardize, as they say, um, you know, the practical way of thinking about or, or understanding how can we actually use all these different ideas. Um, uh, Anna and her colleagues also says the complexity turn has not just con continued, but expanded the revolution initiated by systems thinking, calling attention to particular properties of the world. Properties such as non-linearity, recursiveness, emergence and self-organization amongst others, and unpredictable dynamic behaviors have been associated with systems that are complex. 
so we see that that through this sort of um, really, um, uh, I would say, uh, elaborate or um, profuse engagement with the, with these ideas of systems thinking and complexity these days, um, we're seeing that it becomes more and more important for us to understand what are you know, if we use this language and we do say that yes, the nature of the world is complex. Um, how do we start describing that? How do we start um, giving little labels to that? Or how do we, so that people can actually recognize in practical ways what we mean when we say the world is, world is complex? Because I think we need some conceptual clarity um, to be able to um, make these ideas practical. I think for many of you, you have also been using this framework and these ideas. Um, the huge challenge is really to, to answer the so what question and to say, well, yes, we know the world is complex, but what does that mean for how I make decisions or how do we engage and practice and, and do things differently? And I think that's the huge challenge. And we see that there's such a huge engagement, you know, reaching from the social sciences, economic sciences, humanities, management sciences, in all these fields, people are working with new ideas and vocabularies and methods um, in explaining complexity. And we see that all of those ideas that have been conceptually developed in those fields are now being applied and taken up um, in other kinds of societal domains. And um, we see that um, happening in, you know, being applied into monitoring and evaluation practices, policy making, um, how can we redefine strategic thinking through a systems or complexity lens. We look at, I mean, and most of you have been working with this notion of governance, how do we understand governance from a systemic point of view? And then also um, more recently, the work that most of us are busy with is, you know, how do we understand sustainable development or sustainability? From, from a complexity perspective. And just to get us all together on one, on one table, I think um, this is what I think um, some of my work has been focused on the last few years, is to try and um, arrive at a point where we can actually, through clear conceptual definitions um, and understanding of the features, uh, try and, 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 and look at, at ways in which to communicate these ideas of complexity more succinctly and also more practically. And these are two definitions of um, uh, complexity that I have found through, through many scanning of literature and readings and using and trying to teach about these ideas, very useful. So um, if I had to define or sort of start with a definition a conceptual um, with that has conceptual clarity. I would say that the definitions of um, Jean Bolton, her colleagues and Brian Arthur in his books and writings about complexity for me is, is where I'd like to begin. And I'll just read the definition of Jean and Bolton. She says, the study of complexity is the study of processes, modes of organization mm -hmm. and causal relations that form recursive patterns that constitute the structure and behavior of complex phenomena. What I like about that definition really is that there's a focus on process. And I think that's a general trend today also in this um, field of complexity research is that people are moving away from trying to speak about complexity in terms of um, elements, parts, um, structures and environments or systems and environments. There's a much larger movement towards thinking about how do we think about um, the underlying organizational processes and, and thinking about complex systems really as, as those systems that, that manifest themselves because of the underlying processes that are at work. And that's why I really like this, this idea or this definition of gene because it's also kind of what we call a, a process-based and definition of complexity. How do we, and, and this is for me also kind of a, provide some way of how we can start recognizing complexity. What are the processes, modes of organization, causal relations and recursive patterns that we can start, um, that, that, that could allow us to see complex behavior um, and structures. And I would say those, those four sort of ideas um, captured in that definition has really inspired me in the work that we'll explain a little bit later as well, as to how can we redefine the features of complexity by looking at process um, and also looking at relations 
and and looking at process and relations as um you know as things that are uh yeah as features of, of systems that actually allow then patterns um and through the patterns we can we can start looking at structure and behavior of complex phenomena and i think um this notion of recursivity has become quite central for me um in 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 all the latest readings that i've seen of complexity and already in 1999 brian arthur as he studied the the economic system as a complex system focused on this notion of recursivity his um definition there is common to all studies on complexity are systems with multiple elements adapting or reacting to the patterns these elements create so um look, once again moving away just from components or um you know elements that are more than the sum of the parts um you know definitions of complexity there's a huge trend these days to start thinking about um trying to see the patterns that come about looking at patterns first and then trying to understand what are the organizational or causal processes that allow those patterns and um to come about and i think recursivity which is this notion that that um certain processes influence each other to make those um to in to re that are sort of co-constituting each other as kind of a, a key idea i think behind most definitions of a pro of process oriented understandings of complexity okay um so we see that there's sort of um uh different fields of study also that in, that inform different approaches and fundamental understandings of uh, systems and complexity and in a recent kind of review um we did about you know what are general trends influ influencing the study of complexity thinking or the field of complexity research um yeah there are two or three sort of general trends i would say or clusters of work that's arising so most most important very importantly is this field of computational approaches um i think a large uh, amount of literature and the work that's being done in in highly funded research centers um like those of santa fe or the vienna complexity hub or um utrecht complexity hub for example or um yeah uh, asu in, in america there's there's a number of huge hubs at the moment um in singapore the complexity hub many of those hubs are really interested in understanding um ways of uh of capturing those patterns and dynamics through computational models and um a lot of the literature has also been sort of i would say uh standardized around those uh those kind of computational understandings which really is about observing and analyzing and quantifying the behavior and the connections and structures of complex systems yeah by me a means of various um uh, methodologies through mathematical equations but also algorithms have become quite important ways of understanding and and um computing complexity and the work that's being done in this space is extremely important because it allows us to sort of um yeah uh, keep track of of how it is that we can start um experimenting it's it's almost just an experimental way of trying to see well if these are the kind of behaviors and patterns that come about if we put in these variables and tweak those parameters this is what might play out um it's become extremely important and we've seen how important also be to um look at you know general trends of uh, um outbreaks or how how behaviors will will be happening um and then on another um another cluster of uh, approaches that are engaging with complexity is a more qualitative approach um and i think this is the more kind of subtle uh, approach because there aren't huge centers and um hubs that are you know um organized just around these sort of qualitative approaches but it informs i would say especially the the ideas in management um in very many business schools um in very um and more recently also in sustainability research centers these qualitative approaches are informing our understanding or engagement with complexity and it's really about understanding there's different kinds of theories there's so sort of different kinds of frameworks or conceptual ideas um that has some, some kind of philosophical um approaches behind it 
um, and then we look for ways in which we can govern and act in real world systems and how, how these kinds of frameworks um, uh, that, that can shape our understanding, say, of human nature and um, in interconnectedness could then be applied um, in practical ways. And um, yeah, and, and I'll speak a little bit about that just now. And then a third huge trend that I'm seeing is really what I would call practical approaches. Um, more and more people are really interested in applying complexity-based approaches to solve real-world problems. And we see a huge, huge, huge um, growth in um, practical uh, approaches at the moment all over um, in, in various different spaces where people are designing toolkits there are decision-making diagrams, methods, intervention processes, um, and these are growing in scope and they are forming and informing institutional forms, actually. So there are now um, research centers or think tanks or um, uh, platforms, um, consultancies, communities of practice that are actually gathering around using certain kinds of methods or engagements um, of, of trying to practically engage with um, real world problems by using um, complexity on systems inspired approaches. I've, I've tried to not um, single out a few, but, but just to give some uh, examples, for example, um, uh, there's the Wayfinder um, process, um, uh, which is, there's the website for that, which has become a kind of a process for understanding sort of resilience, but and doing kind of resilience assessments. It's been developed um, initially by the Stockholm Resilience Center, but it's become now also a kind of a private consulting approach, but using definitely sort of systems perspectives and saying, well, if we understand that these problems we're engaging with, with are complex, we need certain different kinds of steps and these steps are really those five steps that the Wayfinder approach um, uh, inspired uh, inspires is really built around um, how can we understand um, engagement or assessing resilience from a complexity or systems um, perspective by by certain steps then that look looks at change from a different perspective um, thinking of a, an, an identity of an organization or a research problem from a systemic point of view um, exploring the systemic dynamics in that program in that problem or challenge um, developing sort of systemic strategies for change and then learning and reshaping from that many of you have similar kinds of um, uh, methodologies um, but this is just one that I could quickly find to, to think of you know this is for example a process design uh, for intervention and doing in a kind of assessment that's based on um, a kind of a systems um, understanding of, of a problem. Then there's others um, I mean many of you have worked with uh, the Kinevan um, approach with Dave Snowden where we which is a decision making um, uh, strategy where we can look at different kinds of tasks and then decide what are they and if they are this way or that way we can you know approach them from a different kind of understanding from from a complexity approach and then even the whole field of strategic foresight is really a way of thinking about um, planning by using the, the idea of, of uh, futures thinking and futures literacy uh, to think about how we can actually engage in planning by thinking about the strategic systemic implications of how decisions can be made. And there's a lot of, lot of different models and approaches incorporated in strategic foresight. One of them, for example, is causal layered analysis, where we try and look at problems with, um, with different aspects thereof, and then how these things can influence one another. And more recently, also the work of um, Michael Jackson, um, who he, he uh, who's from uh, who's from the UK? He's just brought out his new book called Critical Systems Thinking and the Management of Complexity, where he um, really summarizes in that book his um, critical systems thinking approach, which is a very specific way of thinking about how to engage with problems and decision making from a specific um, understanding of of using systems thinking. So we see that there's such a huge. Um, uh, spread of uh, engagement at the moment with uh, practical ways of, of thinking about this. Another um, interesting um, uh, platform or think tank out there, also based in the UK, is this um, organization called School of System Change, 
uh, where they've also sort of come up with a lot of toolkits of thinking about how change happens from a systemic um, approach. And they have many sort of design, design examples of how we can engage with things through collaboration, diagnosis, leadership, impact from systemic um, approaches. So there's no, there's no shortage. And I think this is the reason why I wanted to just um, mention these uh, examples um, is that there's no shortage these days of um, practical um, methods, tools, approaches, toolkits, strategies, design processes that try and engage with um, decision making, intervention and planning from a complexity point of view. The problem or the challenge then once again we find with all of this is that it's extremely overwhelming. Something that was first lacking and <laughs> not existent has become so prolific um, that I think newcomers to the space might find it extremely overwhelming and people are actually starting to engage with, you know, finding little corners and nooks and niche spaces to come from to engage with this in a different way. So what we've been doing, I think, um, the last number of years is to try and think how can we what is it that we can do to introduce people coming from a variety of different spaces to engage or to sort of, if, if we wanted to collaborate, um, how do we start speaking? What are the concepts that we, or, or, yeah, what is the language and the concepts that we can use to start thinking and speaking about complexity? And after a, a kind of a huge literature review um, that we've done over many years, um, uh, we. I came up with this idea that we should um, try and, and, and design a kind of a, a little typology to, to, to classify features of complex systems in a way to more easily recognize complexity. So a typology, um, I know there's a whole theory of typology and a whole science of typology. And if you're a philosopher of science, you'll have a whole definition of typology. But we use this notion of typology really in a very simple and um, uh, uncomplicated uh, manner by saying typology is really a conceptual um, sorting box, in a sense, or um, printer's tray, for example, which allows you to put things together in little boxes um, uh, to, to that, that sort of cluster um, characteristics or features of something that has that, that, that show up or manifest in the same way or have the same structure or the same function, for example. Um, so we look at a variety of different features and characteristics, and then we try and find little meta categories in which to organize things that seem to do the same things as you would, for example, birds that have the same structure of beak, um, um, but, not, but don't look the same. Um, we find a kind of a meta category and say, oh, those are seed pickers, for example, if you can, and you can, you can sort of, you know, typologize them or characterize or put them in a kind of a box because they all have the same kind of beak and they all eat seeds, but they all look different and they all live dif in different places. And, um, but we can say, okay, based on that kind of feature, we can call them or put them, you know, cluster them together, or if they have large beaks, and they can rip meat with them, we call them, we put them in a little cluster kind of thing. So by using that idea of typology, we recently came up with, um, with kind of six boxes also to, to uh, meta-categorize features of complex systems. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about that just now. Um, but just to say that these six features, they, 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 look, they might look and sound the same, as, as sort of general features, but they're, um, we, we've used them to sort of classify meta category. And I'll speak to, with, about that in a little more detail now. But if we, what, what happens is, is if, if you have these sort of general categorizations of different features, we can actually um, use those meta categories or those little boxes or typologies to start thinking in more practical ways to recognize complexity and then to uh, apply that for, pra in, for practical interventions. This work has been done in this paper um, by, in 2018, um, where we try to uh, 
scope or say, well, you know, social ecological systems are complex, but what do we mean with complexity? And um, using these ideas to sort of inform methods for studying um, social ecological interactions or relatedness or intertwinedness, for example. This paper has been, um, yeah, uh, interesting because it also helped us to frame the foundations for a, for a handbook that will come out this year. Um, uh, we wanted to sort of decide, okay, what are different methodologies that we can use to study social, environmental intertwinedness or relatedness, but it was difficult to find a way to, 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 to find what, which methods would, will we discuss. So we discussed, we decided, okay, well, first, if we understand what are the overarching features of complex systems, we would like to introduce or find methods that can then um, illum you know, illuminate the features of complex systems. And that's why we, we thought about finding a typology. And um, this is what the paper looks like. I won't go through that now, but you'll see that in the paper, there's this, this table where we say, okay, those are the features constituted relationally, radically open, context dependent, adaptive, dynamic, and complex causality. Um, in, the, in the second table, there's sort of key features with which you can recognize those first line or meta categories. These are sort of related com um, concepts and then practical ideas for that. Um, I won't uh, waste your time with that now, but we'll, we'll speak a little bit in detail about that just now. And then what we did in another um, uh, paper um, led by Alta de Foss from Rhodes is we used those categories or those features to actually look at many different um, scientific methods that are out there and that are being used in sustainability research and we try to categorize which of those methods like for example decision analysis or impact analysis or participatory data collection collection do um, address these these features um, these general kind of organizing principles of complex systems and by doing that, I think it's quite nice to, if you have a student that, want, that, that are working with Bayesian methods, for example, that you know that if you're working with Bayesian methods, you're actually looking at um, radical openness or um, adaptiveness or dynamic component or the dynamic features of systems. Um, or if you're working with um, agent-based um, modeling, you're working with sort of, yeah, the notion of adaptive, how things change, um, comes out quite strongly. Um, we've used this. We've used this. Um, these six features in policy briefs. Um, try to make make them available in kind of really plain language and practical language. We've used them to think about governance. Um, if you think you want to govern complex systems or um, have some adaptive um, thinking into that, uh, in a recent book. Um, it came out late 2019. My colleague Minka Wurman and I, we, we said, well, if we think about what are governance challenges, how can we use those six principles to think about different ways to act? And we came out with sort of practical and normative heuristics, um, which I won't discuss here, but just to say that, that this is specific ways in which we could be using that. Like I say, we've been using that also to um, organize um, the methods that go into a handbook that will come out later this year, um, Handbook of Social Ecological Research Methods. We've collected 97 authors from 16 countries to work on a variety of um, methods that could capture and um, engage with those features. Um, in that handbook, there's also a chapter where we'll, where, where we'll explain all of that a little bit in more detail. So just to say, the basic idea of, of being able to categorize things in that way is after a huge literature analysis, we saw that there are so many features as they are, you know, or classification of complex systems as they are authors. We see that um, uh, yeah, the pioneer of complexity thinking, John Holland, came up with seven features, a list of seven features for recognizing complexity. Brian Arthur and his colleagues came up with a list of six features of complexity. Simon Levine, who works on sort of um, computational biology or evolutionary biology, has three features. Our colleague Paul Cilia had 12 features. And so the list goes on. It depends on where we come from. We see that people have so many different descriptions 
for how we can recognize complexity. And that we wanted to, we wanted to get away from those list of features and look at rather what are, how can we, if we threw all those features together in, in one huge box, how can we then from all of those features that, that then sort of come together, how can we cluster those features in more, in, um, in more general terms, if we start looking and thinking about process related understandings of complexity, not component system understandings of complexity, but understanding that complexity comes about as these different processes and patterns. We, we then looked at those, all of those sort of um, features that people were being used, have been used and say, well, if we yeah, put them all together in a, in a huge box and start clustering from that um, through the lens that, that, have, that, that processes and relations are important, we came up with this typology of six, um, I would call them organizing principles of complex systems. And I'll just quickly read through a few of them. And sorry, I can't see the chat box or what's happening um, in the Q&A, but we'll get there just now because I'm, I'm just on one screen here. So maybe just to say, um, the first one is what we came up with is sort of to say, um, if we understand that complex systems come about uh, through recursiveness or through processes and relations, um, we can see that all complex systems or one key feature of how we can recognize complex systems is to say that they are constituted relationally. Um, and the way in which we can actually recognize this is, is through a means where we say that um, all, all complex systems um, are process dependent interactions. And these interactions happen on multiple scales and they result in kind of networks of interactive relations. They're defined, complex systems are defined more by their interactions um, than by the components themselves. And if we start saying, well, if all complex systems are constituted relationally through different kind of processes, how can we recognize that? How do we spot that? What are the kind of visual, um, conceptual, um, organizational patterns that allow us to, to spot that or to recognize that, recognize that? Well, we can see that in net-like structures. We can see that in hierarchies. Um, Heterogeneity and redundancy show that. And, and those are all sort of physical, I would say, features or related concepts that links to this notion that, that complex systems come, come about because of their related um, relationality in a sense. A deep, that's a kind of a deep understanding of, of process and how processes come about. And the practical implications for engaging with complexity then based on that feature is the nature and structure of relationships between components in the system have to be considered explicitly. So we have to look at how these, these things are linked with each other. Process is important um, and diversity is key in all of that in, in, in trying to, to come up with that. So this is a little bit just to demonstrate the thinking behind this categorization and how it can be used. Um, the second feature we said is all these if, if, we, if you think of systems being constituted relationally, we see that they are radically open. They actually only come to be because they're embedded in other systems or in other contexts. And this embeddedness, um, which allows them to not be sealed off like little goldfish tanks, um, but, you know, as, as sort of, um, as the, um, as a kind of uh, open, open systems that, that allow flow of energy, information, um, interaction, we, we, we start seeing that they are, you know, that what happens within the systems is being shaped by outside the systems and that those boundaries are actually just human imposed boundaries and they're a condition of how we observe systems. Um, so we see that there are teleconnections, this nestedness, there's exchanges happening, and we should be looking at spotting those processes um, through, you know, understanding it. And what does that mean for understanding what we're doing? Understand it means that projects 
research projects, intervention projects, management projects are not closed contained entities, but open. And they are shaped by the different contexts in which they are. And that changes in one um, scale or one um, context will have impacts on many others. And I think this, uh, what, what this COVID pandemic has shown us is really radical openness. Um, we can't contain, <laughs> We can't contain the, the behavior and the processes that happen um, to just one area. It's it, what happens in Wuhan in China has an impact in what happens in Cape Town or in Johannesburg or in South America in ways that we cannot contain it. We have to really start looking at the, the patterns that, that link these, these different contexts. And this notion of context dependency then becomes a real key feature of, this, of complexity. We can only identify the different um, features of, of CAS through the different contexts in which they're in. And it means that systems must be understood in, um, in the context of their environment um, and that changing a system affects the context as the context then affects the system back. Three more features, they're adaptive and this is maybe the one that you work with most often. Um, how, do we, how do we recognize adaptive Capacities, we see notions of self-generation, self-organization, decentralized control, evolution, memory, um, resilience, even anticipatory capacities. These are all features that allow us to, to um, recognize ad adaptation. And then dynamic um, is another uh, feature and a quality that um, the qualities that that sort of define this notion of dyna dynamicism is this, this, these words that we use, non-linearity, far from equilibrium, attractors, tipping points, thresholds, regime shifts, they all come about because of the dynamic um, processes that uh, allow complex systems to, to come about. And then the last one is complex causality, the notion of emergence um, and the fact that we don't have um, uh, that, you know, that we have top down, bottom up, um, recursive causality happening in systems is what, what causes that to come about. So in a sense, by, what sounds very technical is just to say that um, if we think of processes and relations that bring about complexity, these are sort of ways in which we can Think about recognizing complexity, um, we can use these really six fairly simple words or concepts that are linked to technical jargon. But then once we have those, we can say, well, oh, if, if, if that's the feature of how things come about in the world, this is how we can interact and act um, in order to engage with those things. Um, let me just maybe stop sharing because I think there might be more interesting. So there's a lot more that we can sort of unpack in, in all of this, but um, I don't want to really go through that in extreme detail. I just wanted to maybe just use today to demonstrate, to say that if we if we have this these meta categories that we can use to recognize the features of complex systems, we can do a lot more um, in applying those ideas in real world situations. What we've done in this handbook, um, for which we'll also have a specific webinar to launch the idea of that once it's um, published, hopefully um, uh, by August. You can then look at different methods that you're using in your research or um, activist modes and say, well, if, if we are interested in um, looking at uh, in dynamic interactions, you can have a different purpose for a method. You can see what knowledge type comes about because you're using that methods. What are different research approaches that could that could link up with those different features? Um, and you can then look for methodologies that actually allow you to um, practically apply or, um, yeah, uh, I would say, uh, unpack that feature of complexity. And we've, we've tried to do that in the handbook. It took a long time to, to, um, yeah, to, to unpack it in that way. But I think that's one of the key ideas that we could actually then come up with a map like this at the end of the day and say, well, if you're interested in studying diversity, um, um, participatory modeling could be an interesting um, method to use. And it obviously um, links to notions of um, re relationality, diverse, um, uh, sort of, um, 
contextuality, and you can link it back to those features of complexity. So it just allows us to, yeah, to, in a sense, broaden this, the spectrum of how we can understand how, what are methods, what is it about this methods, what kind of knowledge comes about, what are the actions that lead to them and uh, that we can use um, in that way. I'll stop my sharing um, and try and look at uh, some questions um, and some ideas uh, that, that you, yeah, any suggestions or questions that you have. Um, I think it was a bit of a mouthful, but I think the idea was really just to say, once, if you, if you have a different way of looking at that and use those meta categories to um, have a kind of typology, it allows us to then um, more generally engage with practical ideas for, for how to, um, yeah, how to recognize the complexity and say, well, yes, we're using scenario, scenario methods um, to think about strategies or foresight methodology. So what aspect of complexity do we then um, engage with? Yeah, scenarios are really good for understanding relationality. Um, how things are related to each other. It's also an interesting and wonderful way to understand um, the context relatedness of complex systems. And it, it also in its own way is a kind of, a, um, it looks at um, anticipation and anticipation is a feature of um, kind of this adaptive capacity of systems. If you're saying, oh, we're looking at um, system scoping or we use systems dynamics, um, yeah, systems dynamics is a wonderful way of trying to understand and envision and visualize uh, the dynamic features of, of complexity. Um, tipping points, uh, nonlinear feedback loops, but it's, it's not so good at understanding and capturing emergence, for example. For that, we might need um, a deeper, more a slower mode for understanding and, and a little bit more, more look, look also at context. Um, or you might be saying, yes, I used agent-based models um, for, for my methodology and how can I use that? What, what aspect of complexity does that demonstrate? And through this sort of little typology, we can say, yeah, well, agent-based modeling is a really good way for understanding um, how, how um, agents can adapt and um, how they respond to each other. So yeah, definitely openness, um, adaptive capacity, and even I would say it's one of the few um, methods that could actually start engaging with the notion of emergence. What are emergent processes and patterns that come about when agents interact in a specific way? So that's just a, a small way of sort of saying um, we've, we've developed a kind of a conceptual typology that can help us um, recognize the features of complexity more easier and then apply them in a more general way. And there's a number of publications and uh, that we've sort of come up with and ways of using that. And um, these are all available and we'd love some feedback on that. And more, yeah, more importantly, there's a, there's a handbook that will come out shortly um, that, that will show, you know, how that can be used in a much larger space for understanding sustainability challenges. I'm just going to scroll through the chat box um, to see if there's some questions coming up there. Um, I see there's one question and answer by Tasneem. Tasneem, uh, thank you for sharing. This is incredibly useful in so many practical real world applications. Looking forward to the handbook. Thanks, Tasneem. <laughs> any other questions or any other suggestions, responses? An anonymous attendee, do you have a South African case study that you think displays this process? In the handbook, we've actually also um, produced for each methodology that addresses a specific approach or feature of complexity we've, we've supplied case studies. So yes, there are many case studies available. I can't um, think of one now, but um, uh, for much of the work we are doing at, this, at our center, we use this um, approach that we call transformative spaces to facilitate dialogues or um, uh, engagements with different stakeholders. And the idea behind this transformative spaces approach is um, just the following. It, it, it says, if we understand that change, we can, that change comes about because of 
uh, different relations or the relations people have with each other or organizations have with each other. Um, and we start thinking about organizations and projects and engagement as relations and relationally constructed. We say, okay, if we can change the relations people have with one another, um, allow different people to have conversations with each other rather than just always the same people, um, we, can, in, we can affect change in, in, a, in a way. It's not a way that we control, can control it or measure the outcome of that change, but, but the basic idea is that um, if we can change the relations between certain stakeholders, we can open up spaces, um, change the power um, dynamics between them, change the agency people have, um, and through, through, through in, by um, allowing those different relations to, to grow or be nourished or um, uh, opened up, uh, we can affect change. So this notion of transformative spaces we've also published about, and there's specific ways in which we do that, there's specific understandings of how you should design a space that people can connect in that space with each other. Um, how do you curate such a space? Um, and that whole sort of understanding um, or approach in facilitation is based on the understanding that um, systems are re relationally constructed um, or constituted. Um, and there's some examples of that as well. Um, yeah, thanks Odie, your suggestion that the different methods that we've listed or demonstrated opens up different ways of measuring success or the health of different types of systems. Definitely. Ilza, you've got a question there. How does this typology sit with a so-called postmodern school of complexity, the stuff that Paul emphasized, foregrounding, not knowing, and ethics? Yeah, I think it's not, uh, it's not in contradiction with, with postmodernism um, because postmodernism doesn't say anything goes and we should give ourselves over to chaos. Um, but it says that we should be more critically reflecting upon um, that which we create and construct. Um, and I think definitely this, this sort of um, typology allows us a, a conceptual framework to engage better and more critically with our own ideas. So for me, for example, um, not knowing is part of... Um, uh, relationality. So understanding that, you know, we can affect certain relations and we can maybe allow certain, you know, people to engage with each other in different ways, but we don't know and we can't measure, you know, what the outcomes of those relations will be. But we give some kind of recognitions to the importance of relations. We give recognitions to importance of process. And we start saying that relations matter. And for me, that is a kind of an ethical approach as well. By recognizing um, the reality that brings about these, that relationships or the, that relations and processes bring about, that's a kind of ethics with which I then approach um, my, my methodologies, for example. And then I think the forefront or the new work that has to be done in systems thinking and complexity especially is to think about relational ethics. Um, how do we think, how do we, what kind of ethics can we come up with when we say um, things, um, processes are relationally constituted? How do we think about values and norms as relationally constituted rather than fixed little um, concepts and uh, uh, you know, norms as in silos or fixed in a sense, but norms rather as fluid and, and, and uh, that they come about through um, relations with other norms even. So for me, that's a kind of a, yeah, a, a gap that, that has to be looked at. And I hope to spend some of my work um, next year also looking at how do, we, how do we understand, how can we reinvent relational ethics? Um, that is also based on this radical recursive notion of radical recursive, recursive, recursiveness, understanding that things are so related to each other that they co-constitute each other. I think there's this deep work need, needed to be done in understanding ethics from that perspective. Okay, I see we have one more minute. And um, 
there's another question would it be accurate or just or of justice to think of complexity as wise thinking especially when explaining this to non-academic audio audience my grandfather for example thanks terry for asking that yeah wise thinking and wise thinking would be um a kind of thinking that draws on uh you so if you if you want to then how would you then so the challenge from these six principles would for me be how can you translate the notion of wise thinking to um in, capture relations um openness context dynamic uh, interactions uh, and complex and complex causality um so so those six principles become so general that you can then try and challenge yourself to say well if i want to understand wisdom um how would i redefine wisdom from my context where i am to my grandfather by including relations so yeah and then then ubuntu or ukama um uh or uh yeah indigenous understandings for example of how things are related can be you know can be incorporated and we can translate those ideas into more general um understandings of wisdom okay usually i stop all my um present presenters on the on the spot at two o'clock and um i would like to apply the same rules to, to myself here thank you everyone for for joining and sharing um at, I'll have a look at the chat box um, now uh, after I've done and try and respond to your comments, maybe even through a general email. Um, the videos and slides will be available on the uh, CST website a little bit later. Um, about a week later, we have them nicely branded and they'll be posted on the website of the CST under lockdown webinars. All our uh, webinars are recorded branded and then placed on the website and you're welcome to share and um, interact with that in a specific way. Thank you very much for joining me today um, and it was lovely having you. I'll look through all your comments and um, yeah, we'll be continuing these webinars um, every second week, every second Thursday for the, the rest of the year and we hope to see you soon. Have a great long weekend for those of you in South Africa and lovely to to be in touch with you. Thank you very much.